Right. So my guest today is Galara Vincent. Hi, Galara. Hi. She lives in Devon. She has two children. She is a writer and an associate university law lecturer. She's also a healer. Using a variety of healing methods, she helps her clients to locate and dissipate the stuck energy of any trauma they have experienced. She is passionate about helping women create true connection with themselves and in their relationships. And Hammer, Sickle and Broom is her first book. And I can't wait to dive into our conversation. So welcome, Galara. Welcome to my podcast. So lovely to have you here. I have so many questions for you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, but I think the best way to ask them is I'm going to like spit them into two parts. So first, we're going to talk about your book and then we'll talk about what you do, because it's all interlinked, isn't it? What you, what you live through and what you do now is very much interlinked. So first, let's talk about your book. Um, you have a very eventful childhood and you seem to remember a lot of it. That's incredible. I only remember like four or five things, nothing else. So do you? Do you, did you find that more events were coming back to mind as you wrote the book? Yes. And wow. the, the, uh, the more I think about it, the more events emerge. <laughs> so I feel like I have only included the most eventful events, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of remembering it, there's definitely a sen felt sense of the events. So it's not just something that I remember with my mind, but I can actually go and relive that experience pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's what happens when there is high charge, high intensity events that happen in life. I remember somebody reading my book proposal. Um, so the synopsis and the chapter, mm -hmm. um, and he said, surely there was something good in your childhood, Gulara. <laughs> 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 and um, I went back and I really tried to bring some good stuff and of course there were good stuff but somehow those big events were more me memorable than day-to-day -day, um, small moments of happiness or joy mm. so yes I remember a lot but it seems that I do remember quite dramatic bits I think I think that's normal though isn't it I what I remember is dramatic as well <laughs> it's not a little bit however there you have peppered a lot of the normal day-to-day -day life it, throughout your book as well so um you know the cooking the mundane the chores the uh the cleaning the just being with your nana your grandma um you know all those little details uh to me are what makes the book so rich um, not only in the big things and the big events in like historical events, but also the small things and what makes, you know, life, whether, you know, it makes it interesting or not. That's another matter. But you definitely have made it really interesting. Like I just devoured your book. It took me it. You know, I, I don't devour books in one set, set, setting sitting. So you know, it took me a few weeks, but I devoured it nonetheless. Like, oh, my God. Like I'm immersed in the world of Gulara and. And I think what struck me the most for me is that at the times that you were living through all that, I was in my cozy little village in France and hearing about those events like, oh, the dismantling of the USSR and oh, and yeah, I mean, I don't know much. We didn't have a TV, so I didn't see any images, which if I had, if we had had a TV, I think that would have stuck in my mind more. Um, but yeah, I didn't read newspapers, I didn't see pictures. So I think, so pictures, you were saying that when you remember, you remember the the feelings in your body, but also the pictures, you know, pictures come to mind and then you can put words to to them. Is that right? That's right. Right. So the same with the events as well. Did you remember all those events so clearly or did you do some research? And as you did the research, you remembered? I didn't do much research. There were certain dates I went back and double checked, obviously. It kind of it can become a blur. You do remember the events, but uh, when exactly the invasion was, the, the dates, the time of the year. Yes, I looked up those because um, I couldn't tell for sure whether it was mm. January or March. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as I looked into that, yes, the events started coming back uh, with more clarity. Mm -hmm. But when you live through experiences like that, you don't really... 
that if it's an isolated event, if it's one off, then it can become very prominent and you can remember when it goes on for such a long period of time and it, um, it kind of uh, blends into other events, then it's harder to pull out specific incidents. Yeah, yeah. But still, there were, there were quite, a, quite several of them which mm. were quite significant mm, for sure. points in history. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so I know your first draft was super long and the editing process was, <clears throat> excuse me, was super painful. <laughs> um, how did you decide what to put in your book, what to keep, what to delete? Um, yeah, tell us about, like, I don't know why I'm starting with the editing process rather than the writing process, but this is what <laughs> I want to talk about. <laughs> I think writing process was very cathartic. It wasn't um, as difficult, and I will talk to you about my writing process at that time. But in terms of editing, it was really grueling. In what do you put in? That, I find that's the hardest part of the process. What do you put in and what do you leave out? And I'm sitting with the same question now that I'm working on my second book. What do I put in? Um, and there is no clear answer that in the end, I left what moved the narrative forward. So those events which like something is happening rather than an isolated incident at school or at home or something interesting about culture or <laughs> something that mm -hmm. seems interesting to me um, or might interest somebody else had to go to leave only those events which move the narrative forward. Mm -hmm. So just like in fiction, really? Yes. And actually your book reads just like fiction, like a novel and... It's easy for me to remember because I know you and we've we worked together. It's easy for me to remember that it's not fiction, but I think for a lot of people who don't know you, it would be very easy to go like, wow, this is a fascinating story in itself. So I think you did a marvelous job with the editing process. Um, so let's go, <laughs> let's go to the actual creative process now. Then where, how did it start? When did you start writing? Because I think it was quite a while ago, wasn't it? Yes, I started writing back in 2012 and I started after um, quite a dramatic event that happened because I've never met my dad's side of the family. I was 36, I've done quite a lot of therapy and it just, that wound would not heal. So what I did is to go to find my, to my hometown to find my father's grave and I couldn't find it. So my grandmother meant to help me, just looked around, talk, ask people around, couldn't find it. And I went to buy my ticket back to England, bought my ticket, walking through the town center. And suddenly I remembered something my mom told me when I was maybe seven, eight, she said that I had an aunt who lived in the city center and her name was Tahira. It was something I have not thought for three decades. Wow. I went knocking on doors. And eventually I found the right door and this woman came out and uh, she looked at me and said, you look really familiar, but I can't place you. I said, well, I'm his daughter and all I want is just one photo because I haven't even seen the photo of my dad. And she just cried and she hugged me and she took me in and it was her 58th birthday. I walked into the celebration. There were like oh, wow. of my relatives and I was showered in so much love and None of the stories I was told as a child made sense anymore. So I came back and started writing. I wanted to capture that day. Um, but then once I started writing, it was like, oh, there's more. I, I just want to get this out, out of myself to start with and examine mm -hmm. it and see what's true and what resonates and what doesn't make sense anymore. So I signed up to a writing retreat uh, with someone I've heard about. And that was the start of my journey. So April 2012, um, I went on this writing retreat and then I worked with that person for a couple of years to generate the material. Mm -hmm. That was the start. And how long was that retreat? The retreat was only five days. Oh, um, okay. It was really powerful. And what she, she had a particular approach to writing. So what she, she had five precepts of writing. And one of them was, Go fearward. Sorry? Fear. Go fearward. So go towards your fear. Write about something you don't want to write about. Because 
it has a lot of charge, a lot of juice there. As you can imagine, there was a lot <laughs> I didn't want to write about. Yeah. <laughs> so it was an easy approach in that sense. Um, yeah. You had to say it all then. <laughs> wow. Um, but then I started working with her. She became my mentor. And what I did is to generate 12, 12 pages twice a month. That was roughly 8,000 words a month and send it over to her for some feedback. And she would come back, not so much with the writing critique, but with um, looking at the energy of the writing. Like this really feels strong and this doesn't, it feels, mm. this feels flat, this I don't get anything from. And so um, through trial and error, I started learning the process. I worked with her for three years and I generated about 300,000 words. Wow. They were rubbish words, to be honest. Oh. <laughs> but uh, it got me writing on a regular basis and writing a lot. Um, and to be honest, in that time and for that amount of money, I could have done a PhD in creative writing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if I were to do it again, I might do it differently. Um, but it was very cathartic and being witnessed by somebody who is neutral, who can see you, who can feel your writing. Mm. Um, at that time, it was quite a powerful experience. And how did you fit in the writing amongst your everyday life with your children? Because I, I think... Yes, when I wrote it? through two, two C-sections, right. through uh, many, many sleep-deprived nights. Uh, I used to wake up at 5 a.m. and write before the kids wake up. Um, I wrote after my C-sections, just sitting in bed, <laughs> breastfeeding and typing away. I wrote, um, I used to drop off my son at nursery at 8 a.m. and my work would start at 9 a.m. So I would go straight to cafe and write for an hour before I would go to my office. So mm. were I you just, like super motivated? to finish it, to get through it, to like, to, to be, to feel the catharsis of it all? Or were you just like inspired all the time? Like that just, it needs to come out. I think the first five, six years uh, that I worked on the book, I felt it, it was non-negotiable. Mm. I was so driven, like my soul wanted me to write the book. It was my soul that wanted it to happen. Mm. It was and, absolutely non-negotiable. And was but there an aim behind it, you know? I felt like I have an inspiring story and I wanted to inspire and empower other women. Like mm. if I can live through that and get here, believe me, so can you, especially when we live in the West and there are so many opportunities yes. available to us. Yes. Um, but then after a while, that drive quietened down. I still wanted to get the book out, but it wasn't, it, it, it felt different after a while. So uh, it wasn't this super motivated part of me that wanted to get it done. It was more, I've come this far, I need to finish this. Mm, mm. Well, yeah, after 300,000 words, <laughs> there can't be much more to write. <laughs> and that's when then the editing process started. And then writing was easy. Writing felt I can just sit down and channel the writing. If anything, it was probably not the right mentor for me because I knew where I'm going. I knew the material well. It wasn't like I was making it up. It would be great for somebody who writes fiction. Mm. But for me, it felt writing things in, um, in no particular order made editing process way harder than it should be because there was a lot of material. They were more like vignettes because 12 pages, if you're writing 12 pages, then you round things off or they become thematic uh, or um, they don't fit into other pieces of the puzzle. And it took me a long time to make it into a coherent book. Um, so in the end you chose chronology yes rather than themes but there were vignettes within that chronology 
I always wanted to write in chronological order just because maybe I'm not creative enough, <laughs> but I just felt important to have it, uh, to let it evolve gradually rather than me jumping around or I wasn't trying to get anywhere. I just wanted to tell a story and it made sense to tell it chronologically. Yeah. And it worked. Um, it yeah. works very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so take us through the your publishing journey with Fuzz, Fuzzy Flamingo. Yes. That is who published your book, isn't it? That yes, they chose. did. And thank you very much for the recommendation because that's where I got the contact <laughs> details. Good. Um, Jen is lovely. She, she knows what she's doing. She's very thorough. Um, I was really pleased that she worked through all my grammatical missing articles and <laughs> all the mistakes I've managed to make and been overlooked by many, many people who have read the book and commented, mm. you know, my be be beta readers, etc. So she has a really sharp eye for detail. And she did my book cover, which I was really pleased with. So good. Um, and the most important part is she knows her Amazon categories. And I think partly the success of the book is due to her choices because when you choose them wisely, the chances of, or the, of the book succeeding are mm -hmm. much higher than if I went and blindly chose random mm -hmm. categories, which wouldn't necessarily help the book. So it wasn't necessarily my intention um, to have a best-selling book for a while. I wanted to start with because it felt like, well, if I put this much effort in it, I want it to succeed. And then after a while it was, well, I just want, I would just want the story to be out and for people to enjoy it. But by the time I came to the publishing process, I felt like, well, if I'm doing this, I might as well do well. <laughs> yeah, as well get num to number one and you did. And, and so it helped tremendously. It just gives credibility to the book. Mm. Um, in all honesty, it doesn't mean that it's kind of the bestseller that you see where it sells thousands of millions, um, but it does give a certain credibility to the book and it, it's very satisfying. I can imagine. Less. So this is the cover. For those who will see the video, this is the cover. And for those who are seeing the video, I am. I can't complain about the sunshine. <laughs> no, the sunshine's beautiful. You look like an angel with lights all around you. It's from the I love, I love the um the logo as well. I guess you would call it a logo for your book. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah. really like the logo. Uh, originally, it meant that she offered it as a front cover, uh, and it didn't feel quite right. It felt like um this is not just about the Soviet mm. Union. It's a personal family story, so it felt important to have photos it's my grandmother maternal grandmother yes and uh, me at age 16 yes shortly i after. remember seeing the cover going oh my god it is amazing and i said is that you <laughs> <laughs> no who's no i said who's who's that in on the front cover yeah it's me oh my god uh, yes now I, you know i i recognize you in your grandma more than in you in that in your old picture i remember i said that to you at the time of that <laughs> um yeah the quality i mean being a proofreader and editor myself the quality of the proofreading is amazing i i didn't see that much of your book originally anyway and as you had told me but this first bit is so polished i've gone over it so many times of course it's good but what about the rest of the book uh so now having read the whole book i really can attest to the quality of the editing and the proofreading is really like wow you feel the perfectionism behind it all so well done to you because of course it starts with you and, and well done also to the editor and proofreader so um, it really does make a difference. And I always say this, like you can't just rely on your friends to read your um, to read your book and pick up everything or, or anything, even in fact, because you need a trained eye to pick up the, the inconsistencies, the mistakes, the missing words, the double words, the double spaces, whatever, you know. So definitely I'm not I'm not surprised, but I know you've had really good 
um, beta readers that really helped you as well. So mm. it's, it is also important, which is why sometimes it can take a while to publish your book, even if even when you self-publish it. It does. And um, originally I was planning to go the traditional route, publishing route. Um, but by the time you, I got the book into the shape where it was so satisfactory to send it out, I felt that I was done with the process. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't wait for another two years for the publishers and editors to put more input. I, it felt done and yeah. therefore that route suited me very well. Yes, I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you carried on and <laughs> pushed through that last barrier. <laughs> um, what are your plans now for your next book? Then you, you've hinted at it. Have you start, It sounds like you've started and maybe you're going to approach it differently. Okay. I've got my plan. You've got a plan? <laughs> I have already mapped it out. Good. Um, I've also did a, I've also done a performance. I did a live performance, autobiographical theatre, where I embodied the piece. So I did it with the first book. Yes. And it really helped me at that finishing stage where it wasn't just um, something I've written and thought about, but it was something that I embodied. And so I did the same for the second book and that felt very cathartic and felt like I've already put it out wow. um, in, in some form. So it just need to capture it in words. And, mm -hmm. and Does it that. help with the vision of the book when you do that theatrical work? It does help with the vision, but there's also something magical about embodying the book, mm -hmm. like embodying the content, embodying some of the events. So I found that process very powerful can you take us through that process a little bit like does it are you asked to remember those events and then no it's more or? it's more of an improvisation so we we play a lot in that class and then just allow the material to emerge from within so there might be some prompts some exercises uh some character uh, working with certain characters I'm getting more and more sunlit. <laughs> um, so Just you move if you want. I'm like moving with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was very potent to live it in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like now I just need to sit down and capture it in words. So is it, do you have a video of it? And then can you use some of those words then looking back, watching yourself back? Yes, I, I can. I have a video and I can go back and use some of those. And it helped with the start of the book, for example. Um, just to, the, the second book is much heavier in content. Mm. There is certain sexual trauma that happened. And I kept hesitating to write about like, how can I bring it in? without necessarily traumatizing the readers, but also traumatizing myself going through that event, like how much detail would it be mm. possible to bring and explain the context, explain the cultural context that this is happening in the context of Muslim country uh, where um, women's purity of utmost importance, the cultural background and so, Doing the performance, what I remembered is I worked at the prosecutor's office at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to have two categories of cases, murders and rapes. Right? So, and I remember, I remember going through those files. I was fascinated. You know, I was only 18. Uh, I was fascinated. I was looking through the folders. And I, I, my horror at women stepping forward and telling somebody that they've been raped and the, the whole repercussions of what it meant in terms of the medical examiners were men. They mm -hmm. had to examine them for any signs of struggle, for example. The investigators were men. They had to question them, ask all the details. Um, then they appeared in court and the judges all were men. And so this whole patriarchal setup where women uh, who experienced something like that you know like it really fascinated and agitated me like I felt I, I just couldn't comprehend how they could do that mm. and, and then it happened to me and so 
the the, the fascination dropped away. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but it felt like, for example, that detail that came through during the our rehearsals and preparation for the performance was such a potent way to show what it was like, what was the context in which that happened and why I chose to keep silent for a very, very long time. Mm. I think um, you've, you, you've beautifully planted seeds throughout the first book for the second book. Like I picked up on them because I knew roughly what the second book would be about. And I was like, oh, here it is, oh, here it is. So the purity and um, yeah, virginity, and it's so important for women, for young girls. And it was drilled into you by your Nana from such a young age as well. So I can see now why it was you know, so even more traumatizing for me, for, for me, <laughs> for you, maybe for me as well. I haven't read the book yet. <laughs> so it can be traumatizing reading about something like that. So yeah. I want to be sensitive in terms of how I bring that material mm. for me and for the readers. And mm. so having some creative vehicles for expression mm. feels really important part mm. of the process be a delicate balance but I know you will achieve it beautifully Thank you. Thank you. so um I think it's the right place to talk about the work that you do because um there is trauma and people so there is trauma in your life and people in, and people tend to think of trauma with a capital t something massive that happened and I think in your case uh like if we were to distinguish capital T trauma and lowercase t trauma, um, it would qualify as a capital T. Um, however, there is trauma for everybody. So you work with women who have experienced trauma and they don't even know it. They don't, they think like, oh, well, what's happened to me? It's happened to other women, happened to other people. So what? They, you know, they diminish it. And I remember you diminishing it as well, actually and me going like but that is trauma that is trauma so tell us more about what you do now with your clients um that yeah with the clients that you see in your practice i think we diminish it because it's easier to survive that way mm. but there is only so long like you you can do it for a while but not forever um for me trauma is, does not have to be traumatic it's anything that's undigested unprocessed something that still makes your blood boil or something that makes you feel frustrated or upset years on something that keeps coming back and haunting you or you re-experience it in some way or form to me it's trauma yeah um I, i'm working with um somebody at the moment and this person comes from a very privileged background good family um plenty of abundance everything was great except there wasn't that emotional connection so you wouldn't see it as a trauma mm -hmm. as such but it certainly traumatized this person because there wasn't emotional connection with a parent and that was extremely painful so when we talk about trauma it's very hard to put your finger on it because some of it can also be Pre-verbal, it can be deeply unconscious. For example, perhaps uh, you were an un unexpected child and the family did not want to have another child. Very common, right? Mm -hmm. And so those thoughts of, mm, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I want this child, can already create a sense of being unwanted. I was working with somebody yesterday and um, there's this fear of being truly myself okay so uh, she holds back because it's not safe to be true truly mm -hmm. myself and we were exploring and we were digging deeper okay so what would happen if you were truly yourself um i would be rejected so we dig deeper okay what happens if you were rejected and it went right back into utero right so because she wasn't wanted and um those experiences of our parents hesitating or being ambivalent can create some sort of misalignment in our energy field so okay. then you work through you live through your life and you work really hard in order 
to prove yourself, to find that validation. And yet that you can't really fill that hole. You can't, that void that was created by being unwanted. It may not have been even verbalized, but somewhere in your subconscious mind, you know that you weren't necessarily celebrated or wanted or, um, you know. So, so what I'm trying to say is that very hard to pinpoint trauma sometimes. And so people can rightfully think that they don't necessarily have trauma. There wasn't anything dramatic that happened. And yet in their field, in their being, they know that something's not right. Yeah. And so that will be probably the best indication of whether there is some work to do or not, because it's not something you can think your way through, talk your way through. You can give yourself boost and say, oh, I've got everything going for me. I'm confident all the positive affirmations, et cetera. <laughs> but if there is some energetic misalignment, it doesn't really work. It can take you only so far. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so what's the first uh, healing modality that you experienced for yourself, for your own healing? What made you think, you know what, there's some healing to do here? So I started, I came across Reiki when I was doing some Tai Chi with my teacher. So I did Reiki training in one and two, and I still wasn't quite clear that I need to be on the journey. I did a gestalt therapy for a couple of years and it still just didn't feel like I was getting anywhere with it. And then I saw Brandon Bates, um, she, she teaches the journey method. It's really powerful. She healed a basketball sized tumor in her belly by releasing some um, emotional and physical um, stuck energy effectively of something unresolved in her life and created these processes that she teaches in like 44 countries but she came and gave a talk and she was talking about cellular healing and I went to her talk and I thought this is what I need because I've been talking about my problems with my therapist and I had a gestalt therapist she was very good but it felt like I just learned to talk about my problem they were not necessarily going away and not going away fast enough in my books. Yeah. And so I realized that I need much deeper healing. I need to heal at the level of my cells. And that was the start of my healing journey. Mm. And what, what year was that? That was 2010. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from there, you, you started learning healing modalities for yourself and to help other people yes with journey you could actually um, exchange with your peers you could hold space for each other I experimented on anyone who was willing I have a really good friend uh, I worked with for over a decade now still do sessions with her, uh -huh. her daughter so it, it started more as I've got something really special here can I help you mm -hmm. and then uh, although I really enjoyed journey, the journey process, it used to be quite long. It was two, three hours potentially. And I just do not have, <laughs> I do not have the stamina to sit for two, three hours. <laughs> um, so I found tools which were much more effective and worked faster. Um, so I trained in something called Compassion Key mm -hmm. with Edward Mannix. And I've done extensive training with him. But Pretty much everything he taught, I've done it, including um, 16 months apprenticeship program. And then I trained in something called non-personal awareness, which is magic. And what these tools do is to release stuck energy, release that trauma we were talking about at a much deeper level, at a cellular level, at a DNA level. So when I do healing these days, I release whatever stuck is from DNA, from the whole ancestral line, from <laughs> present day, from past, past <laughs> lives. So I can't cover the whole territory. I also trained in constellations process, which mm -hmm. I find absolutely magical. Perhaps that could be also the start of my healing journey because I did it around the same time as the journey. And what I love about constellations is just how embodied it is. It's something that you feel in your body. It's not mm. something you can think through. 
And it's amazing how interconnected we are as humans, where absolute strangers can have so much insight and information about your life that you'd be amazed to know. So it's crazy. I hear so many experiences of that. I haven't experienced it myself. Um, but I have heard so many people say it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's yes. crazy. Like, how could she know what to say? That is exactly what my mom used to say to me. That kind of thing. That's amazing. So it must. Wow. So um yeah, motherhood. Let's go into motherhood <laughs> as well, because um it was for me really harrowing to see how little time you spent with your mum in the end you were very much with your grandma um and I realized I haven't even mentioned the country that you were born in and lived in in Azerbaijan um and when we think oh that's it there you reunited and you're, you're and your mum it's actually not for that long and your mum moves away again with her new family and and you only see her sporadically and you see her in those demonstrations as things are dismantling and you you don't really talk to her and so how has your mother's absence shaped you as a mother? Yeah, it was, it was a tough one because you, um, you absorb what you see as a child. And when I became a mother, I vowed I would never be like my mother. Mm. I would not be like that at all. And it's really ironic because it doesn't matter what you decide with your conscious mind what you've absorbed energetically is what plays out. And for a while, um, I did what my mother did. I was working, I was busy, uh, I was still there. I was obviously with my children, but my mind was absent quite a lot of the time. So I was worrying about something or thinking about something else, trying to squeeze things in. And so it took me a while before I woke up to the reality that I was living my mother and grandmother's motherhood stories mm. where I, I was a martyr at night because I wouldn't sleep. I used to cover my son and wake up every hour on the hour, check on him. So the first two years of his life, I hardly slept at all. Wow. And imagine how grumpy and unavailable I was because I was tired much of the time I was not able to concentrate and be present with him and to him and it was around his second birthday when I thought he's a little valentine boy so I thought yeah. you know he is my messenger of love I need to learn to love myself in order to be present to my children and so I embarked on a different journey of healing with mm. a different focus on healing myself so that I can be more here for my children. And yesterday I was walking to school with my eight and a half year old boy and he was holding my hand like this, you know, we just, we just walked merrily to school, nothing spectacular. And on the way back, I just cried mm. <laughs> the whole way feeling the tenderness of that, you know, like just being available to feel how precious that is because he's going to be a teenager soon and who knows how long that would last but in the moment just that little act of loving presence to each other felt so special and I think that's what my mother did not quite wake up to mm. um, and still like I go and we have good I've healed a lot <laughs> as you can imagine yeah so we have we have a very loving relationship and yet I go and she's at work a lot of the time and she's still she she hasn't quite got it but yeah. it's her journey and I, there's nothing I can do about it I yeah. still love her um, it's amazing how I was doing training last week we had four days of eight hour training on constellations this is intention constellation slightly different from traditional family constellations and time and again people had really deep processes where that longing for the mother that longing to have her love still shapes their lives mm. in one way or another it goes so deep it, it even i was very touched by this woman who is in her 60s and mother just wasn't there, like wasn't home in herself. Like if you're not home, 
then you can't really be available to your children. It wasn't like she meant it, she was bad or she was mean or she deliberately didn't want to be available. She wasn't available to herself and therefore she couldn't love her daughter the way she needed it. And yet the daughter, after decades and decades of doing work and you know, trying to find a solution, still hopes that somehow she would you know, turn this around. Oh, the hope. The, the hope. hope. The hope. And so what I learned that the more I heal, the more I'm present to myself, the more I am able to be a better mother. It's yeah. not about making sure that they're perfect and they're mm. cared for and doing all the right things, which I tried and felt like I was a failure all the time. Mm. It's only when we love ourselves and available to ourselves, we can be available to other people. And this is what you do with your clients as well. You help yes. them realize, understand, and then process that and then release the... It all comes down to ourselves. Um, mm. I work a lot with relationships. And uh, in the end, it's the relationship with yourself that determines the quality of your relationship with others. Because whatever wounding you have, it really comes out and plays out in your relationship with other people whether it's your children your spouse your colleagues it's the same same patterns if you didn't feel wanted deep down when you were in the womb and that pattern still runs you would feel unwanted by your partner unwanted by your clients unwanted by your children you know like something that deep needs to be healed and then mm. paradoxically everything else transforms too yeah so as with everything, um, stories like yours, they shape all of who you are in your personal life, in your relationship to yourself, in your friendships, in your work with your clients. Um, and we're going to find out even more with your second book, right? Have you got a title yet? No. 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 I, the, my performance was In Search of Freedom. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's the title or it'll change, but something around. Freedom. I'll have a think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this has been amazing, Gulara. Thank you so much for coming here and talk about your book, your writing process, your life. Um, how can people find you in the ether? Do you have website, Luckily, social media? There, there is only one Gulara Vincent. Yes. <laughs> I have checked. There so, is anyway, but yeah. <laughs> so if you look me up on socials, give me a wave. I'd love to connect. Um, yeah. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Very easy to find me. Just search for Gulara Vincent and I'll be there. We'll be there. Excellent. And finally, what's your best writing tip as a parting present to all our listeners? A while ago, um, Somebody said, uh, normally you hear the expression, dance like nobody's watching. And this person said, dance like everybody's watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so perhaps writing from a place of, I know oftentimes they say, just write, like nobody will see that. Just, just write the way, just empty out and nobody will see that and therefore nothing to fear maybe sometimes it's just helpful to write like everybody will see yeah, mm. just give it give it your best shot not necessarily obsessing about the words and getting every word right but coming from that energetic place of you know what i'm going to write something that people will see and love and so coming forward from your heart and letting that energy drive the process Mm, beautiful so write like everyone's reading yes <laughs> uh, thank you very much Clara um, I will see you again uh, when you your next second book is out then for another interview <laughs> bye